morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to our combined worship, our English and Armenian congregations worshiping together for the second week. Last week we celebrated the life and ministry of Dr. Halik Serafian as he concluded his pastoral ministry with us here at Glendale City Church. And this Sabbath we come to celebrate God's gift and a new pastor and family who will be leading our Armenian congregation in the years to come. And so we thank you for being here on a special day for honoring and celebrating Pastor Vegan and his family. For our call to worship, I'll invite you to please stand as I read in your ear. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. I will praise you forever for what you have done. In your name I will hope, for your name is good. service this morning. We greet you with love. It's good to have the two congregations together this morning. I would like to read you something that appeared in the August Pacific Union Recorder uh, in an article by Ricardo Graham, whom we know, 
This is a quote from Ellen White, and I'm sorry I don't know where it's from, but it impressed me this week, and I wanted to share it with you. She's speaking to all of us as they. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting of his spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed, and the burdened heart, burdened heart will be lightened and encouraged. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, we pause here and now to wonder at these gifts that you offer us. We reach out our hands and accept them. We ask you for the uplifting of your spirit. We long to be quickened with fresh life. We need to have our tired bodies and brains refreshed. We need our burdened hearts to be lightened and encouraged. And no one can do these things for us but you. Hear our acceptance of these gifts this morning, Lord. Hear our yes. Hear our heartfelt thanks and love. Thank you, Lord, also for the new pastor and his family. We receive them also with love and ask you to keep your arms around them and bless their ministry, Lord. Be with us in our service this morning. Grant us the beauty and grace of your presence. And now I say for all of us, my maker and my king, to thee my all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. The creature of thy hand, on thee alone I live. My God, thy benefits demand more praise than I can give. We pray and praise you in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. Oh, Lord. 
just a brief word of welcome before our offering appeal. I want to uh, welcome again our LA Metro Region Director, Dr. Gerard Kameny, for being with us again today as he welcomes Pastor Vegan and his family to our region and we welcome him to our church. Um, we are grateful for Gerard's support of this church's ministry and glad that he'll be sharing inspiration from God's word this morning. This month we are focusing, as we do each August, on looking ahead to our goals and our vision as a church for the next 12 months. Uh, in August we focus on financially empowering this vision. In September, we, we focus on the people power who make our ministries run and gearing up for their ministry and getting them ready to go as our new ministry year starts and our fiscal year starts in October. Sometimes we, I was actually joking earlier this morning with somebody, they, they said, look at these beautiful flowers, where did they come from? And I said, you know, they, they just show up here. Well, that's not true. Something enabled the church to have these flowers. There was money somewhere that made this simple bouquet be here this morning. Do you know how a magnificent choir shows up three weeks a month for 10 months? And how on the months like now when our choir is off, we still have magnificent soloists like Timothy who are with us? They don't just show up. People sometimes say, how did your church get so lucky with so many great musicians? We didn't get lucky. We made a choice. We said that when we have worship, we want people soul stirred, stirred by great music. And when somebody walks into this place on Sabbath morning and is feeling a little bit like an orphan, feeling as if they have no belonging, we hope that somehow through the music and through their experience here that they feel a little less alone and a little more connected to us and to our God. Between our two English worship services, we spend $1,000 a week just on music. That's why we have the music that we do each Saturday morning. So this is why we bring to your attention what your faithful giving can do and what can't happen without your faithful giving. Last year, when we asked people to consider what they will give to tithe, which is our pastoral fund support, what they would give to our church, overall city church budget to support all the operations and ministries and staff here. And then when we asked them to pick a plus, a number of you picked specifically to invest in our music ministry. You said, this matters to me. What these people give to us through their talents and their hearts matters. And because people gave to support music ministry, we continue to have the music that we do each week. So again this week, I ask you, think, what will you do to give in the upcoming month? And you say, you know what? I'm not sure yet, and I'm not sure if I've been giving a consistent amount each year and I'm gonna continue giving that consistent amount. I don't think I need to turn in a form. And I would say our finance committee will benefit that every person who calls this church home, who wants to commit to serving in ministry, if you would do the, us the kindness of turning in a form and letting us know, what will your commitment be on a monthly basis in the next 12 months? That helps us know how to set our budget for the next fiscal year. Thank you for caring about this. This is, this is, this is the, one of these moments where we're asking you to express your partnership tangibly according to what you're able to give. And so by you submitting this form, taking this out of the bulletin, picking up an extra form that's in the lobby, 
turning it in during the offering collection, mailing it into our treasurer, uh, that will help us as we prepare for the next fiscal year. Thank you for taking this time seriously and thinking how to support our church. Deacons, will you please stand? Heavenly Father, we sit in this place at this moment and we look where we are and we listen to what we're hearing and we're looking at the people we love and we're saying this is truly great evidence of God's generosity among us. But we also recognize that this experience is not just God's generosity coming from above, but God's generous generosity working through the generous hearts of God's people. And so this morning, as God's people, I ask you to guide us, to help us think, how will we continue your generosity to create this safe, welcoming home for those who are looking for it? Receive our gifts today. Receive our thoughts and prayers in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
1979, when I came to United States first, my English language was limited. We were sitting up there, and I couldn't understand most of the sermon. And um, during all these years, I improved my English, uh, got better, and since we didn't have good English understanding, so we had our Armenian congregation. So we start over there. And now, I couldn't even imagine one day I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna be asked to read Armenian scripture, which, which with the leadership of this church, uh, this happens. I don't know if we can call this miracle or not, but I call it. And I wanna take this opportunity to thanks the leadership of, leadership of uh, Glendale uh, City Church and also Southern California uh, leadership, uh, Pastor Kimini and uh, Pastor Salazar, which this miracle made happen. And I want to take this opportunity to deeply, deeply appreciate your um, work and what you have done for us. You went out of your way miles and miles and this happens. Now I'm gonna read the scripture in Armenian. I know Gartam. This is actually Matthew uh, 19, 16, verses 16 uh, through 22. Gartam, I know Matthewus das nin das vetsis mchoksan yerko. Yev aham mekan yekab noramud yev asets. Pari vartapet inch pari gorts gorts am var havidan kan kyan khunenam. Naya lasses noran interest in pari asum. Which work a party pites me ein make an astvat? Isk te work a gamis gank mutnel, pahir padrant mer, noran assets, worunk, Jesus and assets, sorank. Miss Panir, missionar, Mikoranar, Miss Sudvukair, Padvir Kohora, Yev Komora, Yev Sirir Koinkerin Koan Zipes. Patanin noran assets. Ait amen im yerecho chunit bahetzi elinch panovem pagas Jesus noran asets yete kamenumes katarial dinel genaun etzazg tzachir yev durach katnerin yev genats yev ganz kunenas yerkun kum yev yek hete virins yev for patanin as choskeir lset tertan vats genats vurte shat stats vats uner. And now in English from Matthew 19, 16 to 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God, but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Good morning. When I got up this morning, I was thinking, I'm going to Glendale City Church. 
it seems like I was just here a week ago. I was. Great to be back. Great to be back. Let's pray. Our Father God, what a beautiful day you've created. Every day, Lord, is a work of your creation and your recreation and how you sustain. And we thank you, Lord. We just, we thank you. And as we open your word, Lord, let us hear what you have to say this morning. Because we are weary, we strive There must be a place where we are at home. That place is here in your house. So we ask for your spirit to lead us, Lord, as we open your word. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Glendale City Church is one of my favorite churches. Amen? Oh, That didn't sound very good. Glendale City Church is one of my favorite churches. (laughs) All right. Amen. I'm glad it's yours too. You know, uh, your pastor asked me to preach a homily. A homily. And so I wasn't quite sure what a homily was, Leif, although I kind of know. So I went to the internet and I wanted to look up what homily was. Okay, and, and it says on the internet, hominy, hominy, <laughs> that's like cord. <laughs> uh, homily is, is a diatribe, it said. It is a harangue. And I was thinking, your pastor asked me to do a diatribe here this morning and a harangue, but then it says it's like a sermon. And then I really got confused because I thought a homily was short. You know, but this sermon is actually an abridgment of, of the real sermon, which is like three hours long. And, and so I thought, how can I make it into a homily? And, and here's how I did it. When it all comes down to it, okay, this is the message of the sermon, okay? It's a question. And then an answer. Yes or no? Answer? Yes. That's the sermon in a nutshell. Yes or no? Answer? Yes. That seems very simple. But like the flowers, how did we get to that point? How did we get to the point? See, we live in a world of striving. Isn't that true? You know, one of my sons is a producer at NBC, executive producer at NBC. And he lives in a no-nonsense world. You produce, you in, you out. That's it. You know, there's no like, oh, we understand. There is no understanding. You produce or you don't. And see, sometimes in life, we are so used to striving that our default position in life in general is to, I must produce or else I'm out. Hence, the sermon idea, yes or no, yes. Or I could say, in or out, in. Isn't that interesting? See, we live life with some assumptions, expectations. For example, if you, if you give a person a gift, what do you expect, Leif? If you give them a gift, you expect a thank you, right? You know, uh, uh, or uh, you come home. See, I have a dog. I have a dog. You know, a small dog, it's... A Yorkie Terrier. Have you seen those? You know, a small dog with a big attitude. You know, have you seen those? And so uh, I come home, and, 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 and my expectation is on that dog, when I get in the door, you better be wagging your tail 
and jumping up and down. You know, that is the expectation. And so one day I came home and I opened the door and the dog looks up at me with his glance like, what's up? And I said, what? that's not what a dog does. What do you mean, what's up? Get over here and jump and wag your tail. We have all these expectations, you know. I called this computer guy up and I said, you know, Apple, you know, I said, you know, my screen is black. It's not, the computer is not doing anything. And he runs through these series of questions, you know. Did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? Yes, I did all those things. Uh, Of course, you know what he's going to say last, right? Is it plugged in? (laughs) Well, it actually was plugged in, but the power strip was off. You know, it happens. Expectations. Expectations. So sometimes we come to God with mixed up expectations. We are just really imposing upon him or projecting upon him the thoughts of the world that say, when you strive, you get. Right? You know, of all the places in the world, isn't the church supposed to be the place where you come and finally rest? You know, but, oh, no. This young man, Leif and Todd and Rudy and Ruth up there and Myron, this young man, I must say, he had it all together. He was used to striving. Striving. I must say that he is one of those who would walk into a, a gathering and, and walk like this. Would you say? More like a stroll. More like a stroll, you know? How are you my subject? How are you my subject? Yes, uh, I have worked. I've worked hard. And I earn this position. I earn my reputation. I am successful. I'm sure he had lots of initials behind his name, right? To the the uh, high school diploma, of course. Uh, I don't know that they would call it high school. Would they, Rudy? Probably not. Then the BA, then the MA, then the PhD, and the DMIN, and the alphabet goes on and on and so this young man was used to striving and making things happen and on the outside he's the guy that you want on your board amen right Joe he's the guy you want there oh boy well you know appearances aren't always what they are really Because on the outside, see, he looked like the kind of guy who had it all together. But there was something missing there. Something was missing. See, sometimes the people on the outside who seem to have it most together are most bereft of peace on the inside. Amen. But you could never tell that from the outside. And so, here he was, self-assured, or so we thought. And one day we see something very awkward happening beyond our expectations. It didn't fit the picture very well. We see him doing this. Now, excuse me, okay, I don't mean to desecrate this place, but we see him running. We see him running. (laughs) You know, I was looking at the gospel of Mark. It is the running gospel. Really, it's so interesting. In Mark chapter 9, everybody's running. Okay? And, And in that society, when you ran, that was not very dignified. 
Oh, no, 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 no. The people who have it all together do not run. They stroll. They stroll. But he was running. And, you know, I would like to suggest that the crowd was confused. What is Mahershala Hasbaz doing running? We've never seen him run before. What's the urgency, or must I say, what's the desperation? See, when you're desperate, you throw all cash into the wind, right, don't you? You, know, you are no longer concerned about appearances or trying to make anybody else happy or trying to meet anybody else's expectations. At that point, you just got to get to your destination. And where was he running to? He was running right to Jesus. Running is not very dignified, but I will tell you this. I will run to Jesus any day of the week. And so the crowd, they got their ears up. What does he want with Jesus? This guy is spiritual. He's a good church person. Certainly he's got it all together. What does he want with this rabbi? Are you interested? He comes with a question. What good thing must I, what, do? Oh, that question revealed the whole thing. He comes from a world mindset of striving, of doing, of accomplishment. And so he says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And the crowd is aghast. This question is so fundamental to our spiritual well-being, Edith. It is so fundamental that why would this church leader ask that basic of a question? We thought he knew the answer to that. Sometimes we assume things about each other that we should not assume. See... Now we're going to listen for the answer, right? What's the answer? You must what? You know, keep the commandments. And he's like saying, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. I've done that. And I could just see his face, his demeanor, just beginning to drop. That's what I ran for. You know, I used to watch this show, and I forget the guy's name now, but he was a detective, and he would talk to people, and he'd walk away, and as he'd walk away, he goes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, just one more. Who is it? Oh, Colombo. All right. Yeah, thank you. It's Colombo. Oh, yeah, just, 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 just one more thing. And that would be the thing, right? Just one more thing. And the crowd is like, what is that one more thing? Right? See, I'm sure this self-assured young man, or so it looked, thought, this is going to be easy, Joe. It's one more thing. I have done litany of things. Just one more thing. You know, I took a class. I was a math major at Cal Poly Pomona. And I took a class in Fortran. You know? Well, there's nothing that... I remember out of that class except for one thing. When it came to the final, it had one question. (laughs) And I was thinking, oh my, if this is the wrong question, I am toast. And I kid you not, 
I don't know why they called him a teacher in Fortran because his class had nothing to do with Fortran. I didn't learn anything about it. And, and so, and here it was, uh, he would do these proofs on the board. I mean, three pages of proofs. And just the night before, I thought, you know what? This guy's kind of awkward. I wonder if he's going to ask us one of these proofs. I thought, my word, which one do I pick? You know where I'm going. I, I came to the exam, and it was exactly the proof I had studied the night before. Three pages long, and I began to write, 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 A on the test. But sometimes the one thing isn't that simple. See, we think that the rich young ruler, that the answer that Jesus gave him had to do with money. Friends, that's a mistake. The money represented something in his life. It represented his striving. And he came to Jesus and he said, what must I do? And Jesus said, oh yes, just one more thing. Go and sell all. Now, one thing we don't emphasize enough here is that before Jesus said that, the scripture says he looked at him how? How did he look at him? With eyes of love. He missed that. He missed it. And so Jesus said, oh, just uh, one more thing. Go and sell all. Now, he was probably a businessman. And he was probably thinking, oh, Jesus is an investor Buy low, sell high. It must be we're at the top of the market. It's a good time to sell. But see, with investing, what you do is you buy low, sell high, and then you wait again, and you buy low and sell high. But something changed in the scenario. Jesus said, sell and then he said what? Give. Sell, give. That's not in the financial plan. Sell, give. How much? 80%? 99%? Oh! Do you know what that means? It means all. Now we say amen, but do we really, are we really on that page? And you know what? This man of striving, he couldn't let the striving go. Because there's something about a control issue. When you are in control of your outcome, you do not want to, uh, um, uh, to jeopardize that. You do not. And so he just, I can't do it. I got to be in control of the, of the outcome. See, friends, the one thing we need to understand, the one thing I need to understand, the one thing I need to remind myself about every day is that the yes of God for my life, the in of God for my life, is based not upon my striving, but is based upon the work that he has done in Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus was not asking him to give up his riches. Jesus was saying, give up your striving. Give it up. 
How much of it? 90%? 95%? 99%? No. All of it. Yeah, but you know what? If I do that, then what? They say that the Vikings, and those of you historians, please correct me because I don't want to say this again in the future if I'm wrong. The Vikings would go to enemy territory in their ships. I googled this, okay? That's what I'm saying. Correct me. When they land, what they did was they sunk all their ships. And you might say, why would you do something like that? Because if I keep the ship offshore, then that means I have a way out other than victory, and I cannot take that risk. But the Vikings said, we have victory assured. Isn't that something? So we're going to sink the whole lot of them, and then we're going to go back in their ships. Isn't that incredible? Man. An atheist was talking to a young believer, and he said, you know what's wrong with you Christians? He said, what? You use Jesus as a crutch. And the young man said, excuse me, sir, I don't mean to differ with you, but I must say this to you. I do not use Jesus as a crutch. He is my stretcher. <laughs> are we all in or are we all out? See, the issue is not that we are all in as the issue is that God is all in for us. He says yes when others say no. He says in when others say out. I'm just about at the end. Friends, some of us are going through a lot of stress here this morning, and we've been striving. And when you hear what's going on in the world today, you know, I had a conversation today with a family member. I can't sleep at night. She was tossing and turning all night. Don't you get it? When you see the love in the eyes of God, you can lay it all on him. Isn't that incredible? You mean that you don't have to be the smartest in the room, the most athletic in the room, the white, the brown, tall, the short, the skinny, the fat, it doesn't matter. When God sees your face, he says, yes. He says, in. You may feel like you're out. You may feel like it's a no. But you're in. My wife, when I proposed to her, <laughs> I was that nervous. What's she going to say? Yes or no? And I, I was so nervous, I whispered in her ear. And this is so tacky. You know, but I did. It's a fact. I said, uh, you wouldn't want to marry me, would you? <laughs> I was just leaving myself a way out. 
And she looked at me and she said, yes. <laughs> My poor wife. I feel so sorry for her. What kind of romantic approach is that? She said, yes. Yeah, but I stutter. Yeah, but I this, yeah, but I that. And she said, yes. God, you don't know me. He says, yes, I do. Isn't that incredible? I know you. And my answer is yes. My answer is in. So what do we say to him, right? Do we say yes to him? Let us pray. Our Father God, what an incredible striving it took for us, us to hear the word yes, for us to hear the word in and not out. You gave it all. You didn't give 90%, 95%, 99%. You gave it all. And what we need to learn in this life is quit the striving and just accept the invitation that you are my child. Oh God, we thank you so much. It's beyond our comprehension, our understanding that in Jesus, all the promises of God are yes. So today we are here to celebrate God's yes and many yeses that have taken place in order for us to come to this moment today. It was back, as Robert said, in the late 70s when our Armenian brothers and sisters who were moving into this area, many fleeing persecution, Adventist Armenians whose schools and churches were being closed down, who were looking for a new start and came to Los Angeles, who said yes to we will continue to fight to meet together and create church even in a place far from home. It was because of people who were willing to step up and voluntarily, or for maybe some gas money, to provide pastoral leadership for many years, including over 30 years from Dr. Serafian, who said, yes, this congregation matters to me, and I will continue to commit to it day in and day out. Today, we are here because there have been more yeses. The Southern California Conference growing in their awareness of their needs to be a strong, growing, thriving Armenian language congregation in Glendale said yes to giving money, to finding other money, to help support not a volunteer pastor, not somebody who comes here once a week, but someone who is here on the ground in our community day in and day out as a true community pastor, you know, working with anyone who speaks in the Armenian language or of Armenian heritage. The Glendale City Church, our board sat down, considered this opportunity and said, yes, we will commit financially in the next two years to contribute to make a full-time pastor for the Armenian congregation possible. The Armenian group pulled together and said, Yes, we will commit the same amount as the church as a whole will commit to make a full-time Armenian pastor possible. The Pacific Union, the region, the governing body that includes all of the Western United States of the Adventist Church said, yes, we will commit $40,000 towards this project. But more importantly than that, 
There once was a man named Vegan who was willing. Now, he and his family would say the opportunity to come to the United States, coming to the United States, is a great gift. But you realize what Vegan and his family have given up. Pastor Vegan has been a successful pastor in Armenia. He's been the, the mission president of the Armenian mission. He has worked in the union office of the Transcaucasus Union. And he and his family left their home, left all their possessions, and moved literally entirely around the world to start a new life here with only a commitment from all of us who said yes and, and all of us who took a step of faith to say yes, that faith is, that faithful yes was for only two years. But Vegan and his family chose to move to the other side of the world with only the promise of two years and not even a two-year salary at the same level as other pastors make. Vegan Inga, Naomi, and Daniel made a major yes to come with us. And we are so grateful to have them here. But above all that, we're here to praise God because God has said yes to this moment and this ministry. And so all the other yeses, as important as they were, pale in comparison to the yes that God is saying in this moment, is saying yes this is where I will be working in the years to come. This is the man and the family who I'll be working through with the Armenian congregation. Yes, I am working in the city of Glendale. So I want to give our congregation, the Armenian and English language congregations, a chance to welcome our new pastoral family. So I'd like to invite Vegan, Inga, Naomi, and Daniel, if you join me here on stage. This is a great family. I have been enjoying getting acquainted with them over the last two weeks. Um, Vegan and Inga, how long have you been married? How many years have you been married? Let's put Since you on the spot. 1999. Since 1999. So 18 years, over 18 years of marriage. Naomi is going to be a senior, planning a senior in academy, planning to work to become a doctor. Daniel is going into eighth grade, mm -hmm. and he probably has other career interests, but he also has a career in stand-up comedy. I know that already. <laughs> he is, he is, he's got a quick sense of humor, and I like that. I will have a lot of fun with Daniel in the years to come. Um, I want each of you to know that you being with us is such a gift to us. You being willing to take a true risk, a, a leap of faith to become part of the ministry here is, is something that we are deeply grateful for. So I want you to know that we are a congregation of human beings. And we are good human beings. And most of the time, we will love you and support you and care for you. Sometimes we will have bad days and we will be annoying. We will complain. And we will ask more of you than we should. Because we're a church. And that's what we do with each other and with our pastors. But I can tell you, as a pastor who has been part of this congregation now for almost five years, this church loves and values its pastors and their families. And that love that has been shown to all of us who have experienced it already, I promise you, will be shown to you. 
because we believe that what you give to us is eternally important. And so we will love you dearly. Thank you very much. So we are, I have just a couple token gifts, and I'm going to give it to you, and then you may decide you want to set it down rather than continue to hold it. But these flowers are actually not decoration, but they are Inga, so you can place these on your kitchen table at home and brighten your lovely home. And a card of welcome for your family to express our joy and gratitude at having you with us. Um, we're th so thrilled to have you. So at this time, I'm going to ask our pastor emeritus, Rudy Torres, who was one of the people who said yes at the very beginning of the Armenian congregation, that he would come. And I'll ask our other pastors and our conference director and our Armenian elders, uh, leaders, if you'd join us here on stage, and we're going to pray for this family. This moment is beyond my wildest imagination. Mm, amen. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that we could have come to this moment? It started with a little yes from our school board, from our church board, and then a lot of yeses, and now we've come to this. We're setting this family apart, knowing that the Lord has called them to this place. But in setting them apart, we're also setting ourselves apart to go with another chapter of faith in the growing saga and wonderful miracle of the Armenian congregation. Shall we pray? Eternal Creator, we acknowledge that we did not create this moment. Yes. You called us. You asked us to give up our presuppositions and our oneness to say it can't be done. You looked upon this congregation here, flourishing congregation here, and you said yes. You looked upon us in love and you said, follow me, and we have said yes. When we say yes, we don't always know what we're saying yes to. We know to whom we're saying yes, but we don't know what we're saying yes to. And now here is this family that have demonstrated that they are willing to step out in faith, like Abraham and Sarah, who went from a land that they knew well to a land that they didn't know not understanding what was ahead of them, and yet they became the father and the mother of the faithful. And so we pray that as this family comes and readjusts itself to a new environment, that you would be with every one of them. In a special way, be with mother and father, daughter and son. We pray, Lord, that they might understand that this is a sojourn of faith, and yet, it's a sojourn of faith into a family that already loves them and has already accepted them. So we pray that you would anoint Pastor Began in a special way. Give him a triple portion of your Holy Spirit. Yes. Give them the ability to utilize every member of the congregation in the service of God. The ability to organize this, or, this church as it has never been organized, as a community of faith working in this place that is teeming with Armenian peoples, also asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So now we place our hands upon them, 
anoint them, separate them for this holy work, and we will give you the praise and the honor in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings from the country of Ararat, from the homeland of the patriarch Noah. I am so touched uh, for this warm welcome you have shown to me and my family. This is actually the first time I experience. I want to praise my Lord for this beautiful day, for the wonderful music I've heard, for the sermon that said yes. And I want to praise my God that he thought me um, worthy to stand here before you. I also want to appreciate and express my gratitude to the leadership of our conference in the person of Elder Salazar and Kimene. I want to say thank you very much for this church, American Church and the Armenian congregation, in the person of Pastor Todd and Hovik Sarafian. They were amazing and um, I really appreciate what they have done. But I also want to mention one name I'm especially thankful to a brother uh, that had a dream to see me here, and it was actually uh, some 15 years ago. His name is George Melikian. I don't know if he's here. And his mother. They prayed, they dreamed, and probably this is why I'm here. So I'm thankful to this family of George Melikian and his mother, Turinj. I'm going to tell a short story of my life. Maybe it will be interesting and maybe it will be the encouragement for, for some of you. I was born in a high mountainous village in Armenia. It was a beautiful corner in this earth and I grew up uh, breathing the uh, air of freedom, of mountains, and God was so close, but I didn't know that. Because my mother was a communist, and I grew up in a communist family. So, um, I grew up with a dream that one day, the communism will come and we all will be happy. But it didn't come. So, um, when I was a young man, uh, by the providence of God, I had landed to a beautiful country of Ukraine. You may know it. And I went to study there to find my, um, my place in this life. And after three years of my study in the university, a black man from Madagascar was there studying too. And after Soviet collapse in 1992, he began to uh, provide 
Bible classes in the hostels of our university. And there was a special class, uh, uh, a room which was before called a room of Lenin. So he invited all the students in the hostel to come to Bible courses. And I remember the day when he came to my room. Um, when I got in my third year of studies in the university, uh, some bad things happened in my life. And, you know, uh, the hostels in Soviet universities were terrible. They were like prison, you know. You may see uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, and every kind of person. So uh, my life began to get down and down and down. And it was actually the time that I thought I probably cannot go back home because my communist mother was waiting for me to come educated and engineer. So I said, no, I cannot go because mm, I felt too low and I fell down too low. And one thing I thought that will be the um, solution, um, I thought I need to commit suicide. And, and then it was uh, probably two days after that, when I was lonely in my room, it was too late. My friends just have gone, leaving me in a dark room with lots of smoke and smell of alcohol and everything. And it was almost uh, two o'clock of night when I collapsed to my bed and I said, is there someone who can save me? If there is one, please do it now because tomorrow that will be too late. And then I don't remember anything. Then, in the morning, there was a knock to my hostel room, and this black young man came and gave me a, a card. Gave me a card. It said they are invited uh, me to Bible courses. So I didn't know what's that at that time. And after a while, my friends came in again, and everything continued again. And in the middle of evening, um, I suddenly remembered this card. And I stood up and I said, my friends, I need to go. They were in my room. And I said, why? We are all here, a good company. I said, no, I need to go. Where? I don't know. I just took this card and went away, leaving all in my room. I didn't know. There was power that, you know, pushed me. And then I found myself in, in that loom, uh, room of Lenin. I saw many people sitting and this black guy smiling and talking something. Later I understood that he was talking, uh, you know, about Bible. And I don't remember anything else what he uh, said because I was not in the right mind. Then I woke up because this young man touched me and said, well, sir, we have finished. We have to go. I said, you have finished? And I was so afraid to go out. Where shall I go? I said, is this all? Is this the finish? Can I stay here longer? And he said, but we will come again. Would you like to join us next time? I said, yes, but I'm afraid to go back. So to make it short, I began to, um, 
attend these Bible meetings. They lasted for three months. And in 1992, in December, after two months, I could reveal, I understood that uh, I'm not the person I used to be. There was a miracle. I can't explain what happened to me, but I understood that a whole week passed and I did not drink, I did not smoke, I did not go astray, and I don't speak bad words. I wanted to open the windows and shout with joy. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't explain what happened to me, but this was a miracle of conversion. And later, when I finished uh, my university, I thought, where shall I go? Jesus is coming soon. We need to proclaim. But my nation, my parents, they don't know about it. So I decided to go back and I hoped, I had expectations that the whole nation will listen to me. So I went alone with only one guitar with me. And my surprise was too big when I found such an opposition, such an enmity toward me. I was shocked and I didn't know what to do because the region where I went back to my home, there was not a single Adventist, no one. But later God blessed me and we had a church there and not one but four churches and God blessed me in a way that I could not understand. I just followed him from one place to other place and so I was appointed as a mission president for 10 years and then I was invited to neighboring country Georgia and I stayed there for six years working for the church in a media center and here I am here after six years of service in Georgia so this is the fourth country where I will be serving God I want to praise God for his amazing grace that saved the wretched like me for his wonderful gift I praise God for my family and for my church family I feel like I came home here I want to thank you very much this is so beautiful this is so touching and I think every sinner that comes here like me they will see the love you showed to me and my family and they will feel themselves at home and I want to finish my short story with the text from the scriptures. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. So I never thought that one day I will be here. But probably someone dreamed and prayed for me. Praise the Lord. All the glory belongs to him. Amen. Amen. Now, um, I was given a privilege to serve you by song. The song is actually an English song, but we will sing uh, in two languages with my daughter Naomi. I'm not a professional, like the brother who sang, but we will do it by heart.
Father God, we heard this morning how you said yes in vegan's life. And through your presence, the unexpected presence of God, his life was changed. And now he's here, Lord, to minister here to the Armenian people. I just pray, Lord, for your spirit to use him mightily that we may see new souls into your kingdom. And yet, Lord, at the same time, you've said yes to all of us. And so use us, Lord. Help us to know that when we say yes to you, you become our stretcher. You are the one who holds us up and we have no more to fear because we don't walk alone. And so, Lord, in your presence, we leave this place knowing that this good news of yes is a news that we need to share with others. 
May your spirit lead us to do that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.